Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. The five kingdom keys for business success. That's what we're going to focus on today. And uh, leadership is a result of a person who have discovered these five kingdom keys that were introduced by God. They are necessary for personal and corporate success. These five keys are used by Bill Gates, Stephen Jobs. They're used by McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. These five keys are used by Pizza Hut, Denny's. These five keys are used by Coca-Cola. All the major organizations and companies in the world that are doing very well, they use these five principles. And yet these five principles came from the Bible. So what shocks me is that the people that we call the world are using them very successfully. And the folks who are claiming to be in uh, God, they are suffering, struggling. First, let me give you my definition of leadership real quick. What is leadership? Leadership is the capacity to influence others through inspiration, not manipulation, generated by a passion, which is motivated by a vision, birth by a conviction, which is produced by a sense of purpose. It's a very long definition, but you want to write it all down. It took me about 25 years to write that one sentence. Because that's how long it takes sometimes for you to decipher what something is. I've read so many materials and books and listened to so many DVDs and CDs and listen to some of the gurus in leadership and, and I've come to the conclusion that most of them had parts of the answers. So this is my present definition of leadership after 30 years. If you look at that sentence carefully, you will discover that leadership is not something that you pursue. Leadership is a, is a result. So if you want to become a leader in an area of life, you have to turn this sentence upside down and start from the bottom. For example, if you want to become a leader in the world, you first got to have a sense of purpose. That is number one. It's not showing up there. And that purpose produces a conviction. And that conviction produces a vision that a person sees of their life. Then the vision is what causes the passion. When a person can see a future, it generates a passion for them to wake up in the morning. That passion is what produces inspiration in other people. And this is very important when you're talking about a business. If you're not passionate about something enough to inspire people around you, you'll never become a successful person. When you inspire people, they allow you to influence them. And when you can influence people, which is the impact of your character on them, through your passion and inspiration, then they call you a leader, which is in reality an integration of purposes. So leadership is really a product of 
of discovering a purpose that gives you a conviction that you were born to do something, that gives you a vision that you begin to see how to do it, that produces a passion for you to go and pursue it, and that passion to pursue it inspires other people. Once you inspire people, they will give you their talents and gifts, their energies, they'll serve your vision once they've been inspired. Now what's important here is that if you can inspire people, then you cease being a leader and you become a manipulator. Whoever you cannot inspire, you must manipulate. Most of the people that you call leaders, uh, I call them professional manipulators because they know how to play games with your emotions, play games with your fears, they threaten you. They control you. And we basically call them, in, in, in technical terms, uh, dictators. Uh, the, the, the pulpits are filled with those people. They're not real leaders. They, they manipulate people. Some of the greatest leaders in the world are people who who run non-profit organizations. And that's because they don't not, not necessarily pay the people who are working. The people work for another reason. And that reason is they're motivated by an inspiration they got from the leader. The cause draws them in. And in many cases, that is why it's difficult for pastors to explain their value to people. I'm talking about good pastors. And this is why many pastors' salaries are far below what they should be because in the world of business, sometimes you can't measure uh, in, in quantifiable form the value of that pastor in inspiring so many people to do a, a powerful work and not pay them. Uh, you, you should get paid for that. <laughs> because it takes a lot of uh, skill to inspire people with vision. With that in mind, let me talk a little bit about the power of that vision in business. Business is about living your future. It's about what we heard just now, finding your core passion and pursuing it. And vision to me is a misunderstood component in leadership. So I wrote some thoughts down here from one of my books out there. And I want you to just think about them. Number one, the greatest gift God ever gave man is not the gift of sight. But it's the gift of vision. Why? Because sight is a function of the eyes, but vision is a function of the heart. Sight is limited to the capacity of the eyes, but vision is limited only by the boundaries of your imagination. Isn't that awesome? That's why I am very suspicious about my eyes. I don't trust my eyes when it comes to living. The greatest enemy of your vision is your eyes, your sight. Because sight restricts you to the present. You know why entrepreneurs are always considered crazy? Because they keep seeing things that other people's eyes can't see. That's why I tell you vision is the heart. It's the beginning of business. You got to see something so clearly that you have to describe it to those who can't see it. And that vision is what releases you to the uncharted waters of the future. You begin to dream. Sight captures the present. But vision 
captures the future. Sight deals with what is, but vision deals with what could be. I'm talking to aspiring entrepreneurs today, sitting in this room. Some of you stayed at this luncheon because you want to start a business and don't know what to do. Some of you sitting here because your business failed and you're afraid to start again. Some of you are here because you are in business but you're stuck. You owe everybody and ain't making nothing. Some of you are here today because you are business people and you're basically paying the bills and paying the creditors but there's nothing really to show for your efforts and then there are those here today who are in business and your business is doing fairly well and you you want to go to the next level well here's where you start the business of visionary leadership number one vision is the capacity to see farther than your eyes can see that's how I define vision you got to be able to see beyond what you can see and secondly vision is the ability to see beyond your eyes and you must stop trusting your sight. You cannot see things as they are if you're going to go into business. You have to begin to see things as they could and should be. You know, we built our organization from zero. I mean, it was it's nothing, it's just, just an idea in my head planted there by God of course and I saw this powerful thing, this vision and today everything that people laughed at me as being a dreamer has come to pass you know we employ uh, over 100 people and our business is very, very busy and we affect millions of people. Our products are distributed worldwide and we have to operate a number of business and companies together with that because uh, we are so wide in our global scope that our business demanded that we see like an eagle. We got to see far all the time. Proverbs 29 says something that I want to bring to your attention. Very important verse. When I first read this verse, I was angry at God. Because this verse occurs twice in the book of Proverbs. And the first time it's written, it's written like this. It says, The rich and the poor have one thing in common. God made them both. And I became angry. This particular verse written by the king, he says, where there is no vision, the people throw off self-control. They throw off restraint. Uh, we call it perish, but it actually should be they throw off self-control. And uh, they don't understand the laws of God. I believe that the poorest man in the world is not a man without money. but a man without vision, a woman without vision. That's poverty. As long as you can dream, you're not poor. You are poor when you stop dreaming. When you give up and you accept your surroundings as your future, you are poor. It's okay to be born in poverty, but don't accept it. I was born that way and I didn't accept it. Here's the verse I was referring to. Proverbs 29. It says, The rich and the poor have one thing in common. That's what the verse, Proverbs 29, 13 says. I'm not sure why it's not showing up in this interesting computer they got here, but anyhow. Uh, this is not my computer. I'm not sure why it's not showing up. Uh, but that verse is very important. See, it wants to come up, but it doesn't come up. It's a very important verse. It's not coming up. Anyhow, uh, let me quote it for you. 
it says the rich and the poor have one thing in common God made them both now when I first read that I was poor so my reaction to that was okay this means that God made rich people and God made poor people and I happened to be one of the poor ones he made so I was angry at God then the verse occurs again in the book of Proverbs this time Solomon explains it Paul, Solomon says the rich and the poor have one thing in common God gave sight to both so now I did my little research I said let me go find out what this means and when I studied in the Hebrew language it's, it says this the rich and the poor have one thing in common God made all of them and they became rich and poor depending on how they saw it changed my life the difference between rich and poor is how they see that's what the Bible taught vision is therefore the key to prosperity and success I have a little note here about Hog Island there is an island in the Bahamas that I grew up with this little island was called Hog Island because it had wild hogs on it it's right across from where we lived it's a little, little island and we used to put all of our garbage dump over there. You know, the, the, the city would dump all the dump over there. Just garbage dump. Wild dogs and hogs over there. And it was termed, this is the legal name, Hog Island. Because wild hogs are over there. Just nothing and dirt. Just smelly thing. A guy came to visit the Bahamas just to visit us. He just died about two weeks ago. But when he came to the Bahamas years ago, to visit Nassau where I lived he saw this dirty island called Hog Island and he went to the government and says look I'd like to buy that island and the government figure oh, he wants to buy the garbage dump so they sold it to him for almost nothing and uh, his name was uh, Merv Griffin Merv Griffin bought this dump called Hog Island and decided to build the first hotel on it And then he built a second hotel on it. And then he built a bridge between that island and my island. And then he changed the name of the island just by changing it. He called it Paradise Island. It's amazing what you can do by just changing the name of an island. He saw in a garbage dump a paradise. He built these hotels and wonderful resorts and it became a multi-million dollar corporation and then he sold it to another man from South Africa whose name is Saul Kirshner. He built the largest hotel in the entire region of the Caribbean on Hog Island. It's called Atlantis. Five million tourists come to us a year looking for that little hog island and they leave over a billion dollars a year because of that little island. If we had seen. <laughs> There's an hog island not too far from your house. You call it the hood, or whatever you want to call it. Whatever you call it, that's what it is. Today, we regret as a country and a government that we sold that hog island to that man who had a vision that we couldn't see. Because we never saw a hotel in the garbage. Today, Paradise Island is the number one tourist destination in the entire western region for the entire Caribbean. Hog Island. The rich and the poor have one thing in common. God gave them sight. One become rich, one become poor, depending on how they see. 
So you can see a hog island or you can see paradise. Whoever sees paradise becomes rich. Story about a shoe company in India. I, I like this. It's a true story. There were two young men who went to college out in the West Coast, California. And they were sitting in class one day and they decided we're going to go on a summer vacation to India. So they saved up their monies and they said we want to go and explore India. There's excitement about going to India. So these two American young guys, you know, put on their cut-off jeans with the holes in it and T-shirt, got their backpack sorted out and they you know, made it just enough money to get to Bombay and they lived in hostels because they couldn't afford hotels and they kind of, you know, rode the trains around in India to see the country and they were so excited about, you know, massive Indian country but they had never seen so much poverty in their lives and one day they were sitting in the window of their hostel looking over down at the street and they saw hundreds of thousands of poor, smelly, dirty Indians sitting in the mud there in the street under cardboard boxes and pieces of tin and they had never seen so much poverty there were sores and flies over some of them and, and they, one, of, one of the guys said to the other he said my goodness man I've never seen so many people in one place I mean you know cause India, India has you know at that time over 900 million people almost getting to a billion they're, they're over a billion now and there he was in this massive city of Bombay massive poverty and he said I've never seen so many people so poor man can you see that he said yeah he says, look at that nobody has on any shoes and there's mud and, and the other guy says yeah man wow what a shoe business so they went back home went back to college one of them was sitting there in the class the professor was talking and he began to scribble on a piece of paper different just scribbling and his friend said what are you doing he said nothing and he was designing a shoe because the picture of those thousands of dirty feet couldn't leave his mind he saw a pair of shoe on their feet that could cost 25 cents he designed a a shoe that would be made out of plastic and and when he was finished with the design he he sent it off and got it registered to the Library of Congress and then he sent it to one of the manufacturers to make a prototype and the guy made a prototype of this plastic shoe and he told his, 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 his friend I'm gonna quit school man this is I'm gonna pursue this idea his friend said no man you can't quit school man we got two more years you could hang in there he said no man this this thing could work I see the vision this thing can work we can get these shoes in these Indians feet he says and the, the manufacturer said he can make them for 25 cents the guy says you're crazy you can drop out of school he said, yes sir man I'm gonna try this thing he quit school and took a little bit of money that he saved up got some money from his uncle found a couple of investors and invested his plastic shoe produced his first batch shipped it off to India and began to sell them through a distributor there for 50 cents the shoes went so quickly they couldn't produce them fast enough just these plastic shoe within 12 months he had sold over one million pairs of shoe he became a millionaire 12 months his friend was still in school trying to finish his last year in two years he became a multi-millionaire he was selling now to 15 million pairs of shoes per year he had to build an office a factory he now had a staff working with him the manufacturing plants kicked in and he began to sell these plastic shoes to India and many of you may have seen them in India and within two years he was a multi-millionaire his friend had just finished graduating he came to look for him so he hired his friend his friend was an accountant so he says you might as well count my money for me <laughs> his name was Tom his last name was McCann 
And so began a shoe business. Isn't that amazing that one person can see just bare feet? Another person can see a shoe company? Business. Those who have no vision will be hired by those who do. <laughs> Write that down, please, quick, quick, quick. Let me tell you something about vision. All true vision will be tested for authenticity. I know I told you some good stories, but those stories come with some pain. Banks who don't believe in you. I remember Moev Griffin telling the story of how many banks turned him down. Until finally one bank says, you're crazy, but I'll take a risk. And Paradise became the most successful resort center in the entire region. Every true vision will be tested. When you start a business, brace yourself. <laughs> because there may be like three or four different hells they'll all break loose on you <laughs> am I right so you gotta stay with your passion you gotta believe in your vision business demands audacity persistence you, you gotta believe in it so badly that you're willing to mortgage your house. You know, success is, 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 is a result. It's really not a gift. So here's a couple of thoughts for you before I give you these six items. Number one, the original mandate of God was a business mandate. Did you know that? God is a God of business. Everything is about business with God. You were created to dominate in an area of gifting, not to dominate people. So business is really in everyone here. You were never commanded to dominate people, but to have dominion over things in the environment, birds and fish and animals and trees. Uh, case in point, God never gave Adam a chair. He hid it in the tree. God never gave Adam a table. He hid it in a tree. So it is my belief that you were created to dominate and manage natural resources. If you don't learn to manage natural resources, other people will manage you. Your gift was designed to impact natural resources. And everyone in this room was born with a gift. And there is a natural resource on earth that you were designed to manage, control. Not people, but a gift that you manage that enhances the lives of people. You know, I, I, I think about this thought. You were born with the seed of your business within you. Everybody was born with business. Very few find it. Business is inherent in the human spirit. Can I put it another way? If you don't become deployed, you'll be employed. <laughs> Let me try that one more time. If you don't deploy yourself, you'll be employed. And those who deploy themselves, they usually employ those who don't. So business, it exists within you. Where was business born? Here was where business was born. 
Genesis 126 says, let them have what? Dominion. That's when business was born. Because, uh, and I'm going to move kind of quickly here because we need to get out of here. But I want you to see how this works. The word dominion means kingdom. It means to govern. It means to have sovereign rulership over cows and wood and water and fish. That's what God told us to dominate. Not people. It means to master something. Everybody say master. Whoever masters something becomes successful. One of the reasons why we fail in life is because uh, we become jack. Show me a jack, I'll show you a poor man. Listen, you were not born to do everything, so stop trying. And stop jumping from one thing to another thing every three, three weeks. This is crazy. Stop changing your major every year. This is dumb. It's a formula for poverty. You were born to master something. Say it. I was born to master something. Say it again. I was born to master something. See, that's what we were hearing earlier when, we, when he talks about cutting back on all these distractions. You've got to find something that you master. And look at that second statement. You were created to lead in an area of what? Gifting. You've got to find your gift. Point number three is critical. You were created to master a natural skill. And the two words must go together, natural and skill. If you hate doing what you are doing, it ain't natural. So you got to find out what is my natural skill? What do I just love to do? And then you need to refine it and serve it to the world. It becomes a business. But it's, this is going to get sweet in a minute. Watch this. Your natural skill is your domain. You know, I think of Tiger Woods. And I'm going to use him a lot in the next couple of moments. But here's a young guy who had no interest in being a multimillionaire. He had no interest in being a leader in the world. All he wanted to do was to master his natural skill. So at age four, his father gave him a piece of stick. And said, hit this ball. Age four. And from age four until now, he's still hitting with that stick. And all he wants is that stick. He gets it. I was reading one of his uh, statements. He says, he, he awakens every morning at 4 a.m. and goes to the golf course while you are sleeping. Remember now, to become a lead in any area, you must become the slave. You're missing it. <laughs> you really are. You really are the masters. He's the slave. He's up at four. You're sleeping. But he's up as a slave because he's mastering a gift which he serves you later at 4 p.m. And you pay him $240 million a year just to do it. He calls it fun. You call him leader. Are you getting this? Yeah. He found his natural skill. So, I'll never forget, Newsweek magazine did a story on Tiger Woods two years ago. And the cover story was a picture of Tiger Woods. And they had on the cover story, and I have it in my file, I had to keep it. It says, mastering his domain. Oh, I, I was so excited. It was God's words coming to pass. When you talk about golf, that's his domain. He's king. He's the only guy who can get 3,000 people to run up and down a field on a golf course. He is mastering it. What do you do that makes us come and run up after you? Why do people follow to find me? Why did you come to find me? People drove five, six hours to come to my meetings. Some fly in. 
What's going on here? Because when you master a gift, it attracts its own provisions. Business. Sure. Write this down. The domain is your seed for business. I guess I'm taking you another route of business. See, I can talk about technical things with business, you know, investments, but that doesn't make a business work. What makes a business work is when you understand that you have something that the world wants and they'll pay you for it. And you got to find out what that thing is. And everyone in this room was born with one. At least one. No one came to this earth without something. I'm going to prove that right now. Your domain, your domain is your purpose. What were what you born to do? Whatever you were born to do, that becomes your domain. Please buy this CD, okay? <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm coming now to the six laws of business. Actually, I'll give you uh, five of them. This is the first statement God makes concerning business. And every person in business success are following them. Matter of fact, this is the verse that Bill Gates is using. Stephen Jobs is using this for Apple computers iPods are using this. iPhone is using this verse. McDonald's is using this verse. Kentucky Fried Chicken is using this verse. Pizza Hut is using this verse. And the saints keep avoiding it. They are making billions from this verse. God said, to man be fruitful what's the first command be fruitful second command multiply third command replenish fourth command subdue fifth command have dominion now notice he says over fish over birds over fowl over living things in the screen okay but he gives this man four or yes five simple instructions and then God left him God gave man a business strategy now the verse before this is verse 27 right so God created man etc and the verse before that is, is verse 26 right and that's when God says what have dominion so God tells man in 26 have dominion in 28 he tells him a strategy on how to have dominion he didn't leave him without the strategy. He says, here's how you dominate. Look at it carefully. He says, be fruitful, you multiply, you replenish, you subdue, and then you'll have dominion. You say it again. Be, fr be fruitful, you multiply, you replenish, you subdue, then you'll have dominion. He's, first he said, have dominion. Then he says, now let me tell you how. First you got to be fruitful, then you got to multiply, then you got to replenish, then you got to subdue, and then you'll have dominion. Who dominates golf? Who dominates uh, Big Mac? Who dominates chicken? Turkey fried chicken. Isn't that amazing? These people, do, these people dominate these areas. Who dominates Whopper? It's amazing that I can call a name of a product and it controls the whole area don't get me wrong this is not complicated so there's a picture of my man the four laws of business number one be fruitful okay this is where business begins the word fruitful in Hebrew means productive it doesn't mean to have children I was shocked when I discovered that. Uh, the first command God gave man was what? Be productive. In other words, produce something. 
Oh man, I wish I could talk to you for a couple more hours about this. Say it. Be productive. Stop saying fruitful because you're thinking about babies. Tell your neighbor, be productive. be productive. No, say it this way. Produce something that I could buy. That's the first command. Now, here's something important to remember. The first command is to be what? Fruitful. The first command should have been be seedful. Because fruit is a result of seed. You can't have fruit unless you have a seed that has a tree that bear fruit. God ignores the entire first step. Look at me, man. Just get deep now. God said, look, I even ain't going to talk about seed. Oh, you still ain't got it. Listen, when God demands something from you, it exists. <sighs> so the demand for fruit is a presumption. Some of you are getting it. That there is seed somewhere. The number one reason why there's poverty in North Tulsa is not because of a lack of investors coming in, but a lack of productivity inside. Do you know how you measure? Listen, listen. Here's how you measure a nation's wealth. Listen carefully. A nation's wealth is measured by three letters, all nations. Gross national productivity. In other words, if the nation ain't producing, they call it poor in the UN. Money doesn't make you rich. Productivity does. That's why China is one of the biggest threats right now. Even though they may be poor, they are producing. What do most people in the North Tulsa do? Consume. All right now. Uh huh. You keep going to the bank to borrow money to buy stuff that isn't productive. I mean, if you're going to buy a vehicle, buy a truck so you can become one who collects garbage to produce a business. Don't buy a car to drive around in. That ain't productive. All right now. I'm talking to. I'm talking, I'm talking. The, the command presumes that seed exists in you right now. Oh, I need to spend a week just come on business, you see, because business is deep, see. I'm serious about it. You have a business week. See, because because you, you are sitting here on a gold mine. You can't even find the gold. You don't know what your seed is yet. There's a seed. That's your business. And God says... Show me the fruit of it. Produce something. Now when you produce a product, watch God's strategy now. Let's say, okay, Apple computer. You all remember that Stephen Jobs dropped out of school. You know that. He quit college too. Most successful people quit college. I hope you know that. I almost did. You know, my mom kept me in. That's not why she kept me in. But anyhow. <laughs> Stephen Jobs quit school because he had an idea. I always say idea. idea. That's your seed. Your seed is the idea that won't quit. The 
this guy had an idea. He went to visit a plant to see a computer. Stephen Jobs is an interesting guy. Young fella in college. And he went and he saw this computer. And the computer was big as half of this room. He looked at it and he says, Why can't they reduce that to the size of a desk? And he walked out. And he kept seeing visions of that great massive computer the size of a room on a desk. I wonder what you see that won't leave you alone. <laughs> Write this down. Every problem is a business. I'll say it again. Every problem is a business. One man see bare feet, that's a problem. The other one see a shoe company, that's a business. One man see a hog island, that's a problem. Another man sees a resort, that's a business. Produce your seed, produce your fruit. And then the second command, multiply. You know, when you produce a product, then you got to reproduce it. If you cannot reproduce what you've produced, you're going to be poor. One of the keys of successful business is being able to reproduce your product a million times more. Any good company that wants to succeed must be able to follow God's second command, to multiply so that's why when you want to see, <laughs> there was only one Burger King years ago. One restaurant that sold one Burger King. They refined, everybody say refined. They produced a fruit. Now everybody makes burgers, but they produce a unique burger called a Whopper. Come on somebody. Now you make burgers at home, don't you? But when you want a Whopper, you go straight to Burger King. Even though you got the same bread and beef and all this stuff, you still want it. Because they refined it. Everybody said refined it. I'm talking. See, you, you got to take your seed and produce a fruit and you refine it first. If you're going to be a cosmetologist, you still ain't going to be wealthy. Because anybody can be a cosmetologist. You got to find what kind of cosmetologist you will be. What are you going to specialize in? Everybody sells burgers, but no one sells a whopper. What's your whopper? That's the question. Now watch Burger King. Burger King then takes this whopper sandwich that they refined and they developed a system. Everybody says system. To reproduce the same Whopper every time. So when I went to Mexico one day, we went to, to a Burger King. The same Whopper came out in Mexico. We went down to Venezuela, Burger King. The same Whopper. We were in U the Ukraine, in Russia. The same I said, how can the same Whopper be in every country? Because they reproduce. I poured. They only developed one prototype, you know, one prototype. And they kept testing it and testing it. One prototype. And when they got that one prototype down to a science, that's the fruit. Then they said, okay, now let's assembly line. And they start multiplying. What you cannot multiply, you can never succeed in. My message is my fruit. Leadership, kingdom, purpose. They're my fruit. Now I got to put them in a form where they can be multiplied. So I, now I got to shift into books and CDs and DVDs and, and they're, they're in 25 different languages. I got to multiply. Same message. If you want a Big Mac, you can never get it from Burger King. Because Big Mac is McDonald's fruit. And they keep reproducing it. God's third command, replenish. 
is a big one. If you're going to be successful in business, you've got to be able to distribute your product. You've got to develop a distribution system. You know, Nations Bank, Nations Bank, they sat down in their headquarters somewhere in New York and had a long meeting one night and said, you know something, let's reproduce ourselves in 50 states. So we got to develop what? A system. So when you walk into the bank, everything is in the same place. Okay, Walden, bless his heart, had one store. He said, okay, I got my fruit. I got a store where you can actually come in and get wholesale prices, man. The guy had one store. That's number one. Number two, he decided, I want to follow God's second command. I want to multiply. So he created a system to reproduce Walmart all over the world. Number three, he said, I'm going to distribute my products to those stores. Walmart got his own distribution system. What about yours? And God's fourth command, business, subdue. Subdue means you control the market. To subdue means to control. If you do not control your market, you will die poor. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? Bill Gates was so successful in following God's commands that Congress had to call him in. Remember? He was so dominating in the market. They said, you got to break up your company. We, we can't have you controlling the whole world like this. <laughs> Why? He subdued the market. If you wanted anything to do with software and computers, you got to come through Microsoft. Can I put it another way? Subdue means when anybody wants a product like yours, you're the first one they think about. Subdue. So Ford Motor Company says we're going to subdue the truck market. So they focus on trucks. Mercedes said we're going to focus on luxury cars. Lexus say we're going to be focusing on quietness. Everybody got their little unique burger, see? What's yours? Listen, stop going into just shoe business. You're going to lose. Everybody selling shoes. You got to find a unique kind of shoe. In other words, I'm only going to sell shoes for babies. Now you got your niche. You got your whopper. Stop selling shoes for everybody. You're confusing the market. I only sell shoes for teenagers. You got your whopper. Now you got to reproduce that every time. Open four stores. Then you got to distribute. Make sure that you can get the shoes in every store on time. Then you have to control the market. If you want shoes for teenagers, you got to come to me. I got the most current. I got the widest variety. This is where you come. That's business. By the way, uh, this applies, you know, I'm not in a pastor's conference, but I teach the pastors too. Your church got to follow this. Your church got to have a unique fruit that makes it different from every other church. Because everybody clapping and singing. You better have something that is so different, and then when you open another branch, you can reproduce the same spirit. God says, subdue. Oprah Winfrey, boy, she did a good job. She packaged her seed, reproduced it in her shows, distributed it in every available media company wants a show. Same show. I said, same show. She don't have five shows. <laughs> 
she refined that one hour that's her fruit and then she multiplies it they produce a million different copies of that tape and then she distributes it to all those media houses and then she subdues the talk show day she controls it and now we leave the number five she dominates Microsoft dominates iPod Stephen Jobs dominate what are you going to dominate? T.D. Jakes called me up one day. He says, Miles, um, I'm about to have a leadership conference on a cruise. And uh, the first person that came to my mind was you. That's when you know you are dominating in the field. It's when your name comes to mind first. If someone says, I mean, Let's eat a whopper today. You ain't got to decide where you're going anymore. <laughs> Is there something that you have produced that makes us find you? That's your business. Let me close with this. And then I'll come back next week. There's my girl, Oprah. Little abandoned girl abused by her parents. All she had was what? Idea. Idea. So how do you be successful? Seeds of greatness. Write this down. Everyone possesses seeds of greatness. Say it out loud. Number two, your seed is your purpose and passion. Say it. Your seed is your purpose and passion. Number three, your seed contains your future. Say it. Number four, in every seed there's a forest. Say it. Number five, your seed is the ideas that won't go away. Say it. Number five, your seed determines your natural talents. And number six, I love this one, the world needs your seed. But the world doesn't eat seeds. There's your dilemma. The world eats fruit. So God says, produce something. And finally, your seed is your business. The kingdom of God thinks so simple. You got a seed. Produce the fruit. Multiply it distribute it and dominate it there's room for you in the world the source of business number one you were born to solve a problem say it <laughs> this is how you become great you know you got to think like this number two you are God's response to a need he created. Say it. I am, a, I am God's response to a need he created. Number three. You are the answer to a question God knew would be asked in your generation. Say it. I am the answer to a question God knew would be asked in my generation. What a, a loud scream from the Holy Spirit. Number four, you are the fulfillment of one of God's desires. Say it. I am the fulfillment of one of God's desires. There's something God desired that made you necessary. Number five, you are an assignment your generation needs to experience. Say it. 
I am an assignment my generation needs to experience. We're waiting for you. And number six, you are necessary. Say it. I am necessary. Say it again. I am necessary. One more time. I am necessary. You should take this list and put it on your children's wall and let them repeat it every morning. If they get this, you won't be able to stop them from succeeding. Business is this. Finding your seed, making it a fruit, multiplying it. I have much more to say to you, but we're going to have to go because I need to go too. <laughs> Listen to me. I was asked a question years ago. The question was, how do you become successful? My answer goes like this. You might want to write this down. If you want to be a success, do not seek success. Seek to become a person of value. That's it. I repeat, if you want to be a success, do not seek success. Seek to become a person of value. How do you become a person of value? Simple. Refine your gift to the point where the world needs it. I think any of you who studied economics knows this, that money follows value. Wealth follows what? Value. So don't go after money. Just become valuable. They'll find you. So you've got to develop yourself and refine your gift so well that they come look for you and they pay you to be yourself. <laughs> I was talking to my secretary this morning. I told her, I said, I'm so tired of all the demands. She said, yeah, you need a break. She yesterday told me, I have 987 invitations for 2008. 987 invitations around the world for a year that hasn't begun yet. Make yourself a person of value. And they look for you. Let's pray. Lord, for every business sitting in the chairs here, may they be ignited. Germinate every seed. Let this be the conference where the seed becomes a tree. And Father, I pray that when I come back to this city or visit the cities represented here, that there will be stories coming out saying, look at my Tomacan shoes, look at my Paradise Island, and look at what God has done with my seed that has become a fruit. I give you thanks now that the businesses in this church and in this city would emerge. Because our fruit is not for us, it's to feed the world. 
we are servant leaders thank you again for this great conference we give you praise so be it Mount Airy New Jersey I was in a packed room bigger than this packed to the walls I'm the main speaker they said speak on potential and business I said sure and I spoke that night on discovering your seed and finding your gift and developing it and multiplying it and, and a lady came to me afterwards met me at the book table and I was autographing a book she said Dr. Monroe I, uh, I got the message I said fine ma'am I'm just kind of old lady you know just clothes and kind of old hitched up and she said uh, I work in a hotel I make beds I said that's great she said, but tonight I heard you. I got it. I heard you. I heard you. I got a seed. Tomorrow, Dr. Monroe, I'm going to bring you my fruit. I said, okay. So the next night, limousine pulled up. I jumped out. Some of the aides, bodyguards there was at the door and uh, this lady was standing in the you know, crowd people who knew me wanted to shake my hand and I saw this lady and she had this paper bag in her hand she says Dr. Munro here's the fruit that you talked about last night this is my fruit and she gave me this brown paper bag greasy paper bag I like grease so I took it And I gave it to my aide, and we went into the meeting, had the meeting that night, and did the second session on maximizing your business. I went back to the hotel room, opened that bag. I was tired, took my clothes off, and picked up the bag, and in that bag was six cookies. I'm thinking, okay cookies I got a million cookies I took one bite of those cookies I don't want to tell you what how I felt because you wouldn't accept it but I tell you what I had an experience my toes curled up my I, I, everything my whole body had spasms everywhere I was like, hey, yeah, 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 yama, ha, who shama? Hey, who is this woman? I took another bite. Mm, the whole room began to spin. I'm like, oh God, there was stuff in that cookie that even God didn't make yet. She had it perfect. And before I went to bed, there was one left. My guilt was not upon me. I didn't care. It was that good. I went back to the final session. I said, I want to find the lady. Who's the cookie lady? And she's in the back there saying, me, Dr. Monroe? I said, bring that lady up here. She came up forward. I said, lady, I don't know what you put in them cookies. But let me tell you something. You found your fruit. And I told them that night before I left, listen carefully, what you do with your fruit when you first develop it. I said, give it away free. Volunteer your fruit away. Please remember that. You give it away free. So I left Mount Airy. And 12 months to the date, I was invited back to be the same speaker at this massive conference again. I came there to speak. They wanted session number two on business and potential. Place was packed. I'm excited. I mounted the stage, began to speak. And everything was exciting. The second night, we pulled up. 
limousine opened the door, the bodyguard standing there, and this crowd of people were standing there to get books autographed and to shake my hand. And, I'm, and there was this lady in a nice hat, this pink hat, man, with black stuff on it. And she had on this nice suit with black buttons and trimming, a pink suit with black hat. Whoa, she looked like a queen. And she had this bag in her hand. And this lady began to say, Dr. Monroe, Dr. Monroe. And they were holding her back. And I said, let that lady through, whoever she is. She looked nice. And she bought this bag. She says, I, I bought this bag for you, sir. I said, thank you, ma'am. She said, don't you remember me? I said, no. I didn't know who she was. She says, you don't? I said, no. She said, I'm the cookie lady. I said, stop it. <laughs> Man, she was shocked. Dad cried out. I said, what happened to you? She said, you won't believe it. She said, I bought you my bag. Especially just for you. I opened the bag, and there were these boxes of neatly packaged cookies with nice design and everything. And she said, uh, my cookies are being distributed to all the major stores in the city. I employ 258 people. She said, and my company's already hit $3 million. She said, all because of you. She says, and therefore I want to give you something. And she went in the purse and bought out this envelope. She said, this is just a token of my gratitude to you. Thank you so much. I'm just a cookie lady, that's all. Multi-millionaire in three years. Just a cookie lady. I went back to my hotel room with my bag of cookies. Mm -hmm. Oh Lord now. Jesus. Uh -huh. I couldn't wait to get into them boxes. There. I gotta feel that experience again. Mm, it was almost like, you know, mm -hmm. hey. Decided to open the envelope. There was a check, personal gift, ten thousand dollars. I said, "Lord, give me a few more cookie ladies." <laughs> Mount Airy, New Jersey. Today, her cookies are in all the major stores. She is now being chauffeured, full of the Holy Ghost. Sleeping on a seed, working in a hotel, because no one told her that she was carrying her seed. I pray when I come back to Tulsa, you will have your pink bag, and I want to see your cookies. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you once again for listening to this message, as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.